Now the Cape York agenda, therefore, we undertook an inquiry into why it is that certain peoples have managed to rise up out of poverty, out of the mud of misery. And we learned from the international development literature that places like Singapore and elsewhere throughout Asia, they'd hammered out a formula for development. And the literature was pretty, there was a great deal of consensus about what the ingredients were for development to take place. And so we gleaned from that literature a set of truths about policy that we needed to learn from. The need for good governance, the need for good infrastructure, the need for incentives for better health and better education. The need for social order, for law and order in communities. And of course, very challengingly for us, the need for private property rights. For a regime of secure property rights if people are to prosper and develop. And so the Cape York Agenda was was and is based around an insight into what the development story internationally tells us as to how it is the people of Singapore, people in some states in India and elsewhere throughout the world have begun the process of walking out of the mud. So when we talk about welfare reform in public discussion, we don't just mean tweaking the conditions for welfare payments. We say welfare reform has got to be a transition from dependency to development. The public must understand that our agenda is a development agenda. For our people to get out of the mud hole we're in, we need development. It's just not a matter of putting conditions on welfare payments. Conditions on welfare payments, mandating personal responsibility for parents to send their children to school, to protect their children and so on, are but a minor part of our agenda, as fundamental as those parts are. It is a starting point to mandate personal responsibility. So parents send their kids to school, fed, clothed, with a good night's sleep. That is part of our welfare reform agenda and we're making progress on that. One of the worst things about passive welfare was that it placed no obligation upon people for the receipt of it. And we know now, four decades later, what a, what a bitter harvest we are reaping as a consequence of providing income to people for no obligation in return. This is not a racial thing. This is not an indigenous thing. This is the same condition you will find white people in cities like Kent and Newcastle with the same social problems and the same collapsed families if you place them in a condition of intergenerational dependency. So when we talk about welfare reform, it is about placing obligations on individuals for the receipt of state support. But more than that, it has to be a movement towards development and creating the conditions for people to create their own livelihoods, to work in industries that enable them to earn their own livelihoods. We were very much guided by the thoughts of Amartya Sen, the Nobel laureate, who said the point of public policy is this. Public policy should be about 
enabling people to have the capabilities to choose lives they have reason to value. <coughs> people to have the capabilities to choose lives they have reason to value. Empower people to take choices to better their lives and to pursue the kind of life that they desire. So central to Amartya Sen's formula was the power of liberal choice. But I suppose what struck me about Amartya Sen's formula was that in order for people to have genuine choice, it's not just a pull yourself up by your bootstraps operation. It's not just a question of the wise choices individuals make or their parents and grandparents have made on their behalf. It's not just a question of choice, was Amartya Sen's exposure of the liberal conceit. Rather, Sen said that in order for people to have true choice, they have to have capabilities. You need good health, good education. You need access to infrastructure and opportunity in order to exercise genuine choice. And so the whole problematic paradigm of the 1970s in indigenous policy, which proposed the idea of choice in the orientation of Aboriginal life, you could choose either to integrate into the economy or choose a more traditional lifestyle. The problem with that paradigm was that a young Aboriginal girl, unhealthy and uneducated, can hardly be said to be armed with the means to make real choices. An uneducated, unhealthy young Aboriginal child does not have the true capabilities to choose and to employ the power of choice in making progress for herself. Let me recapitulate the basic model that we have in our minds about the ingredients that must be put in place for our development agenda to ensue. Our model is that of the staircase. We think that the staircase model explains how it is that people across the world rise up in the liberal capitalist economy. In a stratified world, in the pyramid of global capitalism, how do people rise up to better lives? And it seemed to us that the rules of rising up conform with our model of the staircase. The staircase has three dimensions. Firstly, foundations. If a people have strong foundations under their stairs, they arm their members with very strong capabilities. If people take personal responsibility, they have respect for themselves and for their neighbours. We have order in a community. These very conservative ideas serve people well if a people are to rise up in the world. Staircases need strong foundations of norms. And Asian Australians and Asian Americans prosper in large part because their social and cultural norms serve them well, particularly in informing the growth of their youth in their formative years. <coughs>